So now we're going to look at how to assess right ventricular function. Okay. Now there's a few optimal views. Okay. When we're looking at point of care echo that you should consider. Okay. And so we'll go through those views and I'll show you some different changes and then things that you want to look out for of how you actually assess for the right ventricular function. Is there any overload or, or dysfunction? And we'll take a look at that here. So the optimal views that you want to consider are the parasternal long axis view, which is this one here. Okay. Parasternal short axis view specifically at the uh, papillary muscle level is the one we want to look at so we'll look at that shortly okay so that's down here this is the peristernal long axis view and then we have the apical four chamber view which is this one here and the subcostal four chamber view so we'll take a look at these um, it just it shortly here. Now, there's a few things I want to go over just so you're aware. So normal right ventricular size is when it's less than two thirds of the left ventricular size. Okay. So when you're comparing left and right ventricle, the right ventricle should be less than two thirds of the left ventricle in size. And so what we can see whenever there's an increase in right sided pressures or strain in which the right side of the heart has to work harder, whether it's from pressure or volume overload, this can lead to something called uh, intraventricular septum flattening. Okay, and we'll look at what that means uh, shortly. Okay, and we can specifically see that uh, in diastole, and this results in a D-shaped left ventricle. Okay, so if you look here at the parasternal short axis view, okay, again at the papillary muscle level, we're saying that this is a normal right ventricle during diastole. Okay, and so there's your right ventricle your RV, and this is your left ventricle, the LV. So notice the size of them, okay? Now, say that we have an increase in right ventricular pressure or volume overload, and as a result, a consequence of this, we get dilatation of that right ventricle. So remember, normally the right ventricle, so the right ventricle should be less than two thirds of the left ventricle. If it dilates, now the right ventricle gets enlarged. So here's your RV. Notice how much larger it now is. And notice here's your left ventricle. And what's happening is that in that diastole, we get this intraventricular septum flattening. Okay, we'll look at it in the echo just shortly here. But notice the left ventricle gets this D-shaped, okay? D-shaped left ventricle, you can imagine this is almost like a sideways D here. And that's what's pretty much the right ventricle pushing on it because it's overloaded and causing a pressure to move that left ventricle over. Okay, so that's uh, something that you can see. So hopefully that makes sense. If we look at the echo image, Again, at the papillary muscle level in this one, we can see here all these stars are the right ventricle. So I've highlighted the stars as the right ventricle. So I'll erase that here. But this is your right ventricle. This is your left ventricle. Okay. And notice we're at the papillary muscle level in the parasternal short axis view. Now, just uh, so you're aware, if you are not aware of any of these views or the windows that we use to obtain these views, I would go back and listen to the lectures. Okay. So those lectures are how we actually get them and how you can obtain the different levels within each window. Okay. Uh, so here we have the right ventricle and the left ventricle. Okay. So that's normal, normal diastole. That's the normal size. Notice that the right ventricle is smaller than the left ventricle and the size of that. So this is also the right ventricle here. And this is your left ventricle. Okay. So now let me erase that and take a look at the size of them. Notice the size difference. Notice the right ventricle is here and here's your left ventricle. Okay. So this one here is the right ventricle. This is the left ventricle, still in that parasternal short axis view in the papillary muscle level. And notice the size of them, okay? The right ventricle is now bigger. And what we see is they're almost actually the same size, okay? If you were to see this, it's probably, uh, they're about the same size here where the right ventricle is about the same size of the left ventricle here, okay? So that's that case. Now, if you look at this third case here, this is where we have severe right ventricular dysfunction. Notice the right ventricle. If I try to outline it the best I can, here's your right ventricle. And then here's your left ventricle. Okay, so this is your RV. 
and then this one here is your LV. Notice that the right ventricular size is much greater than that of the left ventricle, and notice that you have this interventricular septum flattening. Okay, so notice here it was still about a little round there. Okay, so if I erase this for you so you can see it, notice it's not completely flat. You can still make out the shape of the left ventricle, but notice here the right ventricle and this third one on the right is much larger in flattening the septum. So if I erase this, let's see if you can see it now here. So notice that your septum here, the interventricular septum, meaning the div division between the uh, right and left ventricle, that line is now flat. That's what we call the IVS, interventricular septum, and this is now flattened. So that's the uh, what we see here. And notice you get that D shape of that uh, left ventricle. Okay, so that's what we call that D-shaped left ventricle, and it's a result of the interventricular septum flattening um, as a consequence of an increase in right ventricular pressure or volume overload that's making it so big and pushing it that way. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so in fact, the parasternal short axis view is a great one to look at that. Let's look at the other views uh, here. So next, um, Another thing you have to note here before we move on is that the right ventricular size, it's often difficult to estimate due to its complex shape. We can't always get a good view, uh, but there are some ways, okay, that we can do it. Now, again, this is the bedside echo, so we're not always trying to do a detailed exam. We're just trying to assess the function of the right ventricle. Is there actually some uh, interventricular septum flattening? that may be contributing, maybe the patient, uh, try to understand the patient's underlying pathology. And pathology is that last portion here, a result of an increase in the right-sided pressures, whether it's from pulmonary hypertension, a pulmonary embolism, right ventricular MI, where the right side of the heart isn't functioning as well, tricuspid regurgitation. If you have this over time for so long, it can pr pretty much cause an overload of the right ventricle that it cannot uh, maintain that, okay? and the pressure on the right side keeps building up. Or you can have these intracardiac shunts, okay? You may have a left to right shunt that causes an increase in the right ventricular uh, pressures. So a few other views, okay? We have the apical four chamber view. So that's this one here. Notice again, that star is where is highlighting the right ventricle, okay? This is your left ventricle. And then this would be your left atrium and this would be your right atrium. You can see the valves between them as well. So here between the right atrium and the right ventricles, the tricuspid valve, and then this would be the mitral valve, okay? Our focus here is this right ventricle. So that's normal uh, in diastole of the right ventricle. Notice here in the middle image of the, in the apical four chamber view, again, this is your right ventricle, okay? So similar to that, the other views, and notice that now you have right ventricular and interventricular bulging into the left ventricle. Remember, this is the left ventricle. Notice that the septum, which is this portion here between them, instead of going like, like that, is now curved like this. Okay, so let me erase that so you can see that. So notice how it's curved like that. You have the pressure from the right side pushing over, and it causes that bulging into the left ventricle, okay? Now, if you look here on the, to the one to the right, this third image, okay, again in the apical four chamber view, this here is your right ventricle, okay? And you pretty much, here's your left ventricle. And notice that the right ventricular size is greater now than the left ventricle, okay? Notice how much bigger that is. And you have that bulging, the interventricular septum pushing over to the left side as well there. So that's the apical four chamber view. So, so far we've looked at the parasternal short axis view at the papillary muscle level. We've looked at the apical four chamber view and we have two other views that I want to look at here. Okay, so let's first start with this parasternal long axis view. So again, starred is that right ventricle. So this is our right ventricle most anteriorly. Okay, remember these yellow dots here are the markers, okay? And this is the top of the ultrasound where the transducer is. Okay, so you're looking down. So the most anterior is the right ventricle in this view here. And then notice that behind it, this would be your left ventricle. Okay, and then going out, here's your outflow tract 
in your left atrium here. So anyways, this is a normal right ventricle and I just wanted to show you that image here. So normal right ventricle in this view. All right, and now we have this last view here, the subcostal four chamber view. Again, you have your star here, which is representing your right ventricle. Okay, remember in the subcostal view, you also have your liver here. Okay, you have your left ventricle here, your left atrium here. Okay, and this is your right atrium. You have your valves uh, between each of the atria and ventricles. Okay, so again, this would be your mitral valve and this would be your tricuspid valve. So this is a normal right ventricle I'm showing you here. So I'll erase this, but notice that this is what you see in diastole of a normal right ventricle. Okay, so here's your right ventricle. Notice the size compared to it, less than two thirds the size of the left ventricle here. So notice this big, bigger left ventricle. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. All right, let's review what we discussed before we end here. So again, the optimal views, we went through each view. We looked at the parasternal short axis view, especially at that papillary muscle level in which we saw uh, the different views. We saw that um, what happens is if you have right pressure overload or volume overload, it can cause interventricular uh, flattening as we saw here in that D-shaped, okay? That D-shaped left ventricle as we saw there, okay? We also noticed that the normal right ventricular size should be less than two thirds the left ventricular size. So that's one thing to keep in mind. We looked at the parasternal long axis view, the normal uh, as well as the subcostal four chamber view, what the normal right ventricle looks like. We looked at the apical four chamber view and different things and noticed when that we have bulging of the interventricular septum to the left side as the pressure builds up, pushes to the left side. And what happens? We said that it's often difficult to estimate exact size during this, okay? This is again a bedside echo that we're doing. Um, and so we're looking for kind of what can help guide our management in this patient? What can better narrow our differential diagnosis? So things that we wanna think about. We said that things that increase the right-sided pressure may cause this type of pathology, whether it's pulmonary hypertension, pulmonary embolism, okay, right ventricular MI, so bad right heart, right heart function, okay, can cause this because the right side of the heart has to work harder. Uh, tricuspid regurgitation, especially over time, or maybe even acutely. And intracardiac shunts, okay, those left to right that cause a right-sided overload and increase in pressure can cause this over time. Well, that's the end of this lecture. I hope you learned something. Now, just to keep you in mind uh, of our course material that we have available. So again, if you go to our website, www.ekg.md, okay? So this is our website. And what you'll notice is that if you go to the EKG course here, okay, you'll find stuff that's separate. So notice that we have a number of topics, practice material, lectures, a way for you to contribute. And this is the course here over here. So you'll notice we have over 300 videos or so, and that's more on YouTube. There's another 100 more than 100, about 200 videos that are available with the course. So those are separate videos. And this course is really designed to take you from a beginner to advanced interpreter, okay? So completely separate from what you're getting online for free, okay? These are um, course material that comes with it. So notice that you have a book, okay? And then you also have the pocket guide available. So you can choose which format. They are the same thing, both these uh, book and the pocket guide, uh, different formats. Uh, I really like this small one because you can keep it in your white coat if you're in the clinic or in your pocket and it's really available on the go. Now with the book, you also get videos. So notice these are the videos, okay? And these are a video for every single page in that book. So it's over 30 hours of video. Now there's a number of practice material that I continue to upload there. Okay, we'll have practice questions coming soon. Uh, so all of that's available. Again, this is separate from all the free material that you get already. Okay, so this is more high yield stuff. This is what we used to teach our uh, technicians here and our students here at Mayo Clinic. 
and it's used now among many institutions. So use the, check that out. Now, what it also includes are calipers. So yes, you get calipers with this course, okay? Um, I don't know anyone else that offers that, but you do get calipers. I think they're very helpful and they can, uh, you know, if you know how to use them correctly, uh, can help to identify different uh, arrhythmias that are going on, okay? And then you also get our pocket EKG reference, okay? This was something we've put together as we were developing course for the fellows, uh, and this is really nice. It has every code, as you saw earlier, laid out there, very small pocket guide available. I had help with uh, my colleague, Dr. Peter Noseworthy, who's the head of the EKG lab here at Mayo Clinic in editing it. So this is something that we use um, and we found very helpful. So go to the EKG course, you'll see examples of lectures, okay, why we developed this, okay. A lot of it came about from myself struggling with learning EKGs, having a father that was an interventional cardiologist and, you know, still struggling. So uh, my struggle is a struggle that I don't want you to have in learning them, okay. You can read all those introductory books, but honestly, they are not uh, enough, okay, and you find yourself using other resources which is part of the learning process. I wanted to expedite that process for you and make it less uh, inefficient uh, in pretty much what I struggled with going and learning through EKG. So again, from beginner to advanced level with this course, uh, you get the book, the calipers, the coding reference, video access, okay? And now we're offering 25% off. 25% off, put that code in on checkout and uh, you'll have yourself 25% um, off that will even, it's pretty much covers the cost of what we use to print the material. So uh, we don't really make much off it. It's more to help our learners grow and really be able to contribute to patient care. That's why we do this and we love doing it. So thank you so much for your support. Um, if you have any questions, just leave them below and we're happy to answer them. All right, have a great day.